Muy buenas noches. Welcome to the Latino Bookstore at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. We have another installment of the Texas Authors Series, and you can expect every second Friday of the month, you can expect wonderful writers from all over Texas, from right here. And this is basically the pinnacle of a big movement to make sure that the West Side has literature for you too, because we are here to make sure that you can see all the writers you want, have all the books you want, and I can't wait till one day your book is published and you're up here presenting it, okay? Because that's really what we want for all the youth, especially if they live here on the West Side. And uh, my name is Tony Diaz, a libro traficante. I'm proud to be the literary curator for the Latino Bookstore. But this can only be possible because of some of our leaders. I do want to mention the writers we're featuring tonight. So happy to have Matthew Tavares with his brand new book, In Search of Venusian Oceans. He'll be reading from that in a little bit. I'll give him a longer introduction in a little bit. And also, uh, our dear friend Guadalupe Garcia McCall is here with two, talk about two of her books, Secret of the Moon Conch, Hearts of Fire and Snow. Applause, applause. And we'll give them a little introduction, a longer introduction in a little bit. And um, I do want to pre-introduce our city council representative, Teddy Castillo, who's going to come up after our director, Christina Bailly introduces her because Christina had a vision. This was an empty building before. This was a neighborhood that corporate publishers are not gonna come. If you wait for a corporate publisher or a corporate bookstore to come here, they are not coming. If you look on your phones, Google bookstores, they are all to the north of the city. Here it was a book desert until Christina Bailly said, we must have a Latino bookstore here. And here it is. Please welcome La Mera Mera, the director, Christina Bailly. Tony, thank you very much. And thank you for helping bring that vision to reality. Uh, Tony has been making sure that we get authors here uh, every month. We've been having authors now every month uh, and every second Friday of the month for almost two years now, right? We said we're going on two years. Um, this building, like Tony said, it was renovated uh, with funding from our city, from the city of San Antonio. These were from bonds from 2012. We got 839000 and then again in 2017, um, 450,000. And so it's really important to have the support of our city government. Actually, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center was formed because of city government. Um, in When San Antonio went into single member districts, I think it was like in 1976. And uh, until then, there had been no Mexican American representation you know, on our council. And then that's when we got people on council like Henry Cisneros and Maria Antonieta Berriozabal and some other folks you know, that finally were taking control of the budget you know, and were being able to make decisions and funnel that funding to neighborhoods that desperately needed it, like the west side of San Antonio. You know, now that was, of course, like 40 years ago. We're still working on it. You know, we're still working on all of this because there's these corporate forces, as Tony says, you know, that, that we constantly, you know, need to uh, be working against. So well, I am happy we, we are lucky, you know, that to have had our so the support of our local city council people, you know, over over some decades past and over some times past, and especially now with our councilwoman, Terry Castillo, uh, she is, really understands the neighborhood because she is from here just a few blocks away. And as a matter of fact, and she knows what's going on because uh, she surprised me when we opened up the bookstore, she was here at the opening and she said, yeah, I saw you guys working there late last night <laughs> because she was driving by late last night and she saw the lights on and she could see in through the windows that we were like frantically putting up this place at the last minute, the day before the opening. Um, so she knows what's going on in the neighborhood and she's been working very, very hard to make sure that this neighborhood uh, is given what it needs, you know, given and rightly so. And one of those 
I, and also I, I want to let everybody know, I think that most people know that we uh, are in the process of renewing a lot of the campus of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. We have three blocks of properties here. Uh, we're working on the master plan, you know, to renovate everything. And we're starting, of course, with the Guadalupe Theater. This is a theater that has been here since 1942. It means a lot to everybody. And uh, thanks to our councilwoman, uh, we were able to secure from our local TERS board, that's the tax increment revitalization zone, I always have to think about it, um, we were able to secure $3.5 million for the renovation of the Guadalupe Theater. And that was all thanks to our councilwoman. So with that, I will introduce to you somebody that we're very grateful for her support, our local councilwoman for District 5, Ms. Terry Castillo. Well, good evening. It's always a great Friday when we're spending it right here in El Metal Wessel and in San Antonio's first ever Latino bookstore. So let's give it up for Christina um, for all the work that she's put into this. And then as well as to Tony for ensuring that we continue to challenge the book bans that take place in Texas and ensuring that community members have access to literature that we know helps nourish our youth uh, for us to know our history. Um, but with that, I'm really excited to be here with our poets, Matthew and Guadalupe, for this uh, really important event for San Antonio's um, uh, ensuring that we're co connecting folks to local poets, right? So just really excited to hear the work that you all have and just want to remind folks while we're right here at the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Cultural Arts District, um, the, the important role that the arts play, whether it's performance, dance, poetry, it's a radical act of love and movement building. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing you all this evening and thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is fantastic to have elected officials come to the community and I think sometimes our community members don't understand what happens with TERS. I always have to Google the exact acronym, but at the end of the day, we have to remember that there are individuals that can decide where the money goes, and if they know about our community, they can look back and say, you know what? This is a great cause, and this is a great cause. Uh, I just wanna add a couple other things that distinguish the Latino bookstore from any bookstore. If you look around us, we still, we still have up the Refusing to Forget exhibit. And we had uh, some of the founders from the Refusing to Forget program, um, Dr. Martinez and Dr. Gonzalez, who were here, shared work from their books. But basically, these are archives and these are posters. It's the first time that they've been exhibited in a community center. They've been at major museums but we wanna make sure that this is here where the people can come and enjoy it. It should be natural as we listen to our poetry, as our elected officials join us, our history is here on display. And why is it important? This was attempted to be erased. This is not a conspiracy theory. We know that Arizona had banned mixed American studies before. And we know that even right now, it's a challenge to get our history and culture into classrooms but we're not here to depress you, okay? We're here to fire you up, why? Because as you said, what a wonderful Friday to convene. Actually, there's so many wonderful poets in the room as well, so many wonderful, so many wonderful writers as well. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll give them shouts out too. Um, but we are here to replenish ourselves, each other, our underground libraries, our community libraries, our family libraries, and it's gonna rain books here on the west side from now, forever. And tonight is no exception. Um, I do wanna mention a couple things. We're joined online. Uh, Rodrigo Bravo is from Nosta Palabra, one of our producers. He's joined by Roxana Guzman online. So this is live streaming right now on the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center's Facebook page. So please do go on there and share it. Send it to your friends. They should be jealous. They're like, what? But that, that they can check it out. Also, we ask you to share this, but also we're gonna share it. So Rodrigo is gonna edit the audio. It will appear 
on the Nuestra Palabra radio show in Houston at 90.1 FM KPFT, fourth largest city in America. They're going to be, we get jealous. We're like, what? Where's the Latino bookstore? Allá? Like, no, hombre, no me digas, right? So they get to hear this. It will be Tuesday at 7 p.m. Also, Rodrigo edits it for a podcast, right? So if you go to our, we're on all the platforms. Um, if you go to any of those, you can click on and listen to the show and share it. And then some of the video will, might air on fox26houston.com as well. So we want you to know that this is archived, but this really does matter. Um, just the last thing I'll say about that, we found out from the founders that some of these archives were just kept in families' houses for decades. No sabían por qué. Something compelled them to save it, right? And then decades later, it was time, right? So every act is building up. And what's wonderful is we have these wonderful books to share. We're going to start off with um, Guadalupe Garcia McCall. And she's got actually uh, a book coming out shortly. And uh, Hearts of Fire and Snow will be out. There's a special that she had for us is that um, th these are called the Advanced Reader's Guide, the Advanced Reader's Copies. So she had three. And the first three folks who bought one will get a free copy of this. Of course, I abused my authority and I bought one right away. So, <laughs> so sorry, I bought it. So there's still two more. So I encourage you to add that to your family library and the story as well. And I do want to read um, a little bit from the book jacket and then also uh, what I know about uh, Guadalupe Tambien. I say this too because her book is published by Bloomsbury Press Review and it is important for us to hear um, how they project us. So she's an award-winning author of Under, Mes Under the Mesquite, Summer of the Mariposas, Shame the Stars, All the Stars Denied, and Echoes of Grace. She's received a Pura Belpre Award, a Westchester Young Adult Fiction Award, and the Tomas Rivera Mexican American Children's Book Award, and was a finalist for the William C. Morris Award and the Young um, and the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Young Adult Science Fiction and Fantasy, among many other accolades. She advocates for literacy and diverse books. She lives with her husband in Texas. What they don't say is she lives about 20 minutes away from here. Okay. And what they also don't say is she's been in the classroom for a long time. It just worked out then that she could dedicate herself and take a risk to dedicate herself to literature. And we're so happy that we can take part of that tonight. So please welcome Guadalupe. Thank you. I should silence my phone too, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here today, Tony, and the council members and everybody who came to see us. I really, truly appreciate this opportunity to share my work with you again. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I think I, I'm going to start by saying that I actually have a book that deals with this presentation here, refusing to forget, the author of um, one of the one of the books that I read is actually one of the people that put this together, and so I wrote a whole novel about it called Shame the Stars, and it is about a time in Texas when, you know, Mexicanos were being lynched on the border, and there was a lot of atrocities and a lot of bad things happening, but. Uh, my Joaquin came to me, he said, write my I need you to write my story, and I did, and it's out there in the world, so if you get a chance, check it out from the library. So, a few years ago, I was um, sitting on my couch, I had turned in one of my manuscripts, and I was watching a movie, and I don't know if you've ever seen The Lake House, has anybody seen The Lake House here? So, with Sa Sandra Bullock and Ken Reeves, so... The, the movie was, I enjoyed it so much that when the credits were rolling, I thought to myself, as I do often out loud, because I talk to myself all the time, I thought, now why doesn't someone do something like that but for YA? And my husband was standing in the kitchen like 10 feet away from me and he says, oh, I don't know. If we had a YA author in the room, we could ask her. And I was like, ha ha. But immediately, my mind flipped on. Like my writer's mind went, okay, if I was gonna write this book, 
for YA. It was going to be a Guadalupe Garcia McCall book when, you know, the Mexican stuff and the Spanish words everywhere. What would it look like? And then I thought, well, she would be an immigrant girl who had to leave her village. And she has to come to the United States because she's all alone. She's lost her last family member, her grandmother. And her grandmother gave her an address and said, this is your madrina in the United States, and she can help you find your father. And I got chills, and I was like, oh, my God, she has to come find her father. But I have to make it really, really important for her to leave right now. So maybe there's some kind of like low-level criminal who has decided that now that she's alone, she's his to take. And he decides, hey, you're going to be my woman. Don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of you. And she's like, uh, no, I don't think so. And she leaves. So I thought, yes, yes, perfect. And I started getting excited. And then I thought, OK, and if she is in present time trying to immigrate into the United States without documents, it's going to be hard. But who is he, right? And that's when it hit me. He is an Aztec warrior during the fall of Tenochtitlan. And he has to get away from the city because the Spanish have decimated everything. His whole family is gone, just like her family is gone. And he is actually fleeing from the battle because they're after him, because he's a warrior. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be epic. And I'm already like, seeing scenarios in my head and I'm thinking battles and you know they're going to help each other they're going to communicate across 500 years of time and then it hit me I don't know anything about the fall of Tenochtitlan like I know it fell that's it like nothing and I was like oh too bad I can't write that story and I was like well I could write it I could study the time period, I could do some research, I could study the language, the culture, I could really dig deep, like I did with Shame the Stars, the novel for this, which took me five years of my life. I thought, another five years? I don't know that I have another five years. I don't know that I wanted to develop for five years. And then it hit me. I have a friend, David Bowles. David knows everything. He teaches Nahuatl at the university, you know, in the Rio Grande Valley. I'll ask him, I'll ask him to kind of like give me sources so that I don't have to dig through piles of information. I'll just tell him, give me what's important. This is what I need. And he'll help me because, you know, we're friends and he'll help me. I know he will. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to see him in a conference. I'll go ahead and ask him then. The story keeps growing in my head, like I am seeing visions at night. I am ha having dreams about this story. It is so good in my brain. And I'm like, this is going to be so good. And then I see David. And the minute I see him and I said, David, let's go to dinner. I have a literary proposition. And he was like, well, that sounds interesting. So we go to dinner and I tell him the thing. And then he's like, so you want me to help you? And I was like, no. I want you to write it with me. I want you to write the boy and I write the girl and then it'll be, it'll go faster. And he was like, I'm in. Like he was like hook, line and sinker. The guy was going for it. Then he said something really interesting. He said, you know what? I just read an article. They just found a beautiful conch, una, una concha. And it has all the hieroglyphs from they believe to be indigenous during the you know the triple alliance the aztecs but they really don't know where it came from or why it has the glyphs and he's like looking on his phone already trying to check it out and he says what if it's a moon conch it is meant to be blown by one of the priestesses of the moon goddess. And when these women would blow it, it was a, a ceremonial conch. It was how they, they connect it to the community. It's magical. And only women are allowed to, to blow on it. But he is so desperate in that moment that the, I mean, he's cornered. They've got him cornered and he has to get out. 
what if in that desperate moment, he blows it? And that's what connects him to her. Because, and I went like this, she found it in the future? And he goes, yes. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be so good. <laughs> and so that's how we started. And then after that, every time we saw each other at a conference, we would actually just go, let's go talk about our book. And we'd say bye to our friends and go sit in a corner and just hash it out, hash it out, hash it out. And then two years went by. What all we did was just talk about our book. And then after two years, he said, okay, I think it's time. I think we've got enough of what we want to do with this novel. We should plan it. But by then I had moved to Oregon. So I wasn't even in Texas anymore. And he's down here in uh, Donna, Texas. And so I was all the way in Oregon and he said, let's do a Zoom. So we got on a Zoom. We started a Google Doc technology. I love it. I mean, I think 10 years ago, we couldn't have done this, right? It, it's, it's just because of technology and, and where we are. And so he started a Google Doc and we started putting down the plot, just laying it down. And we were like popping, just popping off of each other. And it became such a joy for us to just text each other and say, hey, I added something, go look at it. And then he'd go look at it and, and he'd add something. And it was just one of those things where it felt like he and I were communicating just like our, our two characters were communicating, only we were communicating, you know, same time, but 2,000 miles away. They are communicating 500 years ago to the present. So now that you know that story, I thought I'd, tell, I'd do a little bit of a reading. So I'll read you the first chapter because there's something really interesting that happened. But I'll tell you after that first prologue, which is written by David in David's young man's voice. And it says, prologue, Calisto. I crest the low bluff and the vast ocean spreads out before me, jade green and sparkling. I've never seen so much water, though I have dreamt of the ever flowing skirt of mother sea twining itself around the world, swaddling us in her watery embrace. I would stare like this for hours, but the Spanish are still at my heels, reinforcements conveying from the city they established at the mouth of, of the Huitzipant River. Excuse my pronunciation of those words. I'm not as good as David at this. Gripping the, grip, gripping the moon conch against my chest, I begin my descent towards the beach, feet slipping clumsily on the tricky sand. I am a child of the highlands, son of the mountains, born to live and die close to our father, the sun. But she needs me. She must receive the sacred conch this tenuous thread of magic that connects her heart to mine across expanses of time and space. Clinging to rock and root, I make my way down. A rod or so from the bottom, I let go and drop to the sand, resting to, for the briefest of moments. Movement catches my eye, and I glance up at the strand. A hundred Spanish soldiers are rushing at me, mounted on horseback. At their head stands the priest, his eyes wide as he sees the conch in my hand. There is no time to lose. I cannot fail her. She must find it. Without it, she will despair. Without it, she will not have helped me. Both of us will be lost. Both of us will die. Goddess, give me strength, I cry as I burst into, my, into motion, my feet pounding the beach, driving me towards the sea. Their Harbeck buses spit lead balls into the sand around me. An arrow graces my stomach leaving a long and bloody groove. I do not stop. 
Ignoring enemy fire, I plunge into the foaming waves, the conch held high. Take it, Mother Sea, take the sacred shell and place it in her hands. And with all my strength, I fling the pink spiral into the swells. Moments later, unexpected hands haul me out from the water. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction when he sent it to me. I was like, holy moly, what did I get myself into? This guy can write, like he can write. And I was like, put your gloves on, let's do this. <laughs> and so I sat down and, and thought, he just set up the epic, grand story that it's going to be. So my job in chapter one is to bring it down, to bring that lens, that white lens, bring it down on her so that you can see who he's talking about. And so I'll read you a little bit of that. The crescent moon wavers and fades upon the black mirror of the darkest sea. Away from the city lights, the calm water looks black as tar and just as thick. I'm afraid to think of what might happen if I should dive into it. Nothing good could come of that. I've never been to Boca del Rio at night. When I was very small, before my father left, I was afraid of the ocean. Mommy used to try to make me strong. Always challenge the darkness. Ask the ancestors to help you to stay strong, she used to say. But mommy has been gone for almost seven years. She died the summer after I turned 10. Her broken heart couldn't keep her alive anymore, not when she refused to nourish herself to spite Don Nicolás, the drug lord who wanted to him to marry her, um, her to marry him, and let him take my father's place in her heart. At her funeral, the women of Songolica said Nora Morales was like a cardinal the red bird that would rather perish than be taken captive. I saw a red bird die in my father's hands when I was five years old. The poor thing had flown into our house by mistake, a frightened, confused flurry of fiery feathers. It flittered from floor to ceiling, looking for a way out until my father lifted a bedsheet high over his head and flung the cloth over it. Carefully, he took it from under the sheet and held it in his left hand. Mommy begged him to let it go before it tensed up and died, but my father was hell-bent on keeping it. I got it for you, he said, to remind you of my love while I am away. I think the bird died because it knew my father would not return. Maybe it knew his love was untrue. I want to say I miss my mother, but how can I? When my father left, it was like she left with him. I tried getting close to her. I hugged her and kissed her and told her I loved her. But I was too late. Her heart had ceased up and there was nothing I could do to save her. I shake off all thoughts of my mother and sit on the space, sandy, on the sparse sandy gr grass of the shore, away from the laughter of my school friends. They are too young and self-absorbed to understand what I must do. This is how they decided to spend our last night together before I depart. But while they come here to ask the moon to find them new boyfriends, I came to get away from the predators taking over our neighborhood. Like carrion birds, gangs of angry young men congregate in our streets. Veracruz is infested with them. But now that they are moving up into the mountains, Songolica 
is not as safe as it used to be. If my father were still here, if he had not gone to the States, but that is not worth considering. With his strong character, he might have already met with violence, and then I would be a true orphan. Before she passed away, my maternal grandmother, Lucia, who's been my caregiver all these years, prepared me for the journey. Repeat her information, full name and address, and phone number. Again, she asks, quizzing me daily. Tomasa Ruiz, 1847 Prairie Road. I repeat the address she has mem had me memorize. Von Army, Texas. I know it by heart, abuela. Don't worry. She will take good care of you, Abuela Lucia said every time I repeated the foreign words. Tomasita is your madrina, your mother's best friend in the world. It is her job to take care of you when I am gone. For months after the gangs made it necessary for me to quit my job at the bodega, Abuela Lucia and I lived on the calditos I made her from the vegetables I cultivated in our garden. After a while, though, she stopped taking nourishment. I took her to a doctor. He said it wasn't the meager diet or our poor living conditions that were taking a toll on her. She's old, he said. It's just her time. I know we all have to die but my wounded heart twists in my chest when I think of her now. Without my grandmother, I have no one to run to, no one to guide me, no one to love. Looking back, I see Abuela Lucia was right. It's time for me to leave. Because even if I were to get a job in Songolica, I wouldn't be safe living alone. I have no other choice. I have to go to Los Estados. Maybe with her knowledge of that foreign country, my madrina Tomasa can help me find my father because I don't know how to begin looking for a man I haven't seen in over 12 years. Thank you. And so of course she finds the conch. <laughs> because she's at the beach. And uh, that's the whole premise of the story, that she finds this magical conch and that she starts hearing things coming from it. At first, like murmuros, right? Like little murmurs. And she's like, what is this? She doesn't even know it's coming from the conch. Um, so I'll be happy to tell you that as impressive I was with David, uh, with his first chapter, he got my first chapter because something interesting happens. Uh, in the chapter, he said, whoa, I never saw the grandmother's ghost coming. And I said, neither did I. <laughs> That's the magic of the conch. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so she has magical, a magical conch, but she also has her grandmother's spirit kind of protecting her along the way. And that's how she makes it through. I thought I'd take a few minutes, just a few minutes to talk about this next one. Um, when, when we were done with this one, almost done with this one, David was in my kitchen and, uh, he said, and we were just kind of like finishing up the editing process. And he said, Hey, that was so much fun. And I said, I know, I, I can't believe we're all, all it's over. I want to do another one. And he said, do you do? And he, I said, yes. He goes, me too. He goes, what do you want to do next? And I said, listen, we could take every single myth in the Aztec mythological dictionary or, you know, the, all the stories from our ancestors, from the indigenous people, the Maya, the Inca, the, the Aztecas, we could take and we would have enough material to write a book a year for the rest of our lives and we wouldn't even touch it. We wouldn't even scratch the surface. We have such beautiful, beautiful stories. And he said, no, you're right, you're right. Which one do you want to do first? And I said, you know, I have always loved Popo and Itza, the volcanoes, you know, with the warrior carrying the girl and then she's like, oh, you know, I have always loved that. It's so romantic and sad and, and just heartbreaking. But at the same time, if you know the story, it's so beautiful. Um, 
And I said, and I, I refuse to believe that they just turned into volcanoes and she's a dormant volcano and he's a, he's a live volcano and they will never be together again. What if they, we could find a way of bringing them back to life? And he goes, I like it. And immediately he starts going, uh, you know, there are two volcanoes, there are volcanoes in Nevada, in Reno, Nevada, and some of them are dorm, most of them are dormant. What if they come back at that time in Reno, Nevada? And, and I said, but we need to think about how they're also, all the other, other people are gonna come back too. So we started dreaming, how would all the people involved in that tragedy, her father, her mother, the general that sent Popo out to get killed, all of these players came back in Reno, Nevada in present time. And that's what we have here. Hearts of fire and snow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate you. That's fantastic, Guadalupe. Thank you very much. And uh, like, like you mentioned, you're very kind because you mentioned the next two, because I took one, but <laughs> she's having, she was kind enough to have three advanced reader copies for you. So if you're the next two folks to pick it up, you'll get this as a wonderful addition to your family library. And I should mention one other thing. So it is National Poetry Month. However, as prose writers, there's no National Prose Month. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are poet laureates, there's no novel laureates. So I said, you know what? We're going to have prose and poetry. So, <laughs> so thank you for, for crossing another border with us. Right? And of course, I do want to give a shout out to the poets who are here for us because it is National Poetry Month, of course. And uh, we got a bunch of poets in the room. So I want to make sure I say hi to them. And if I forget anyone, send me a text. Uh, of course, uh, my dear friend Natalia Trevino is here con su mamá. Buenas noches, como están? Uh, our dear friend Carmen Calatayud is here. Como estas? And speaking of poet laureates, poet laureate for the whole state, the Texas poet laureate, Irene Lara Silva is here. Como estas? I don't know if you know this, but you, if you are Texas poet laureate, you can park wherever you want. You're officially never late. Like it begins when you get there. So a few, a few perks of that, you know? Uh, I see. <laughs> and Jen, and Jen también, hijo. See, I wrote, I sat down and then I wrote this and I keep updating it. So uh, thank you. And then next, next month, because every second Friday of the month, just program it into your your, your uh, calendars, por favorcito. We have two more poets coming because we crossed that border too. We're like, let's keep, let's keep the poetry month going. Why does it got to end, right? So uh, next May 10th, we're going to have Jacinto Jesus Cardona with his uh, new collection, Amapola Song. And uh, Alma, who's our store manager, studied with him. That was her, her, her teacher, which is fantastic. And then also... Um, we're gonna have Edward Vidaure, who is the publisher of Flower Song Press by Throat by Miracle. And that brings us to our poet for this evening. And um, I'm gonna talk about Matthew Tavares and his book, In Search of Venusian Dreams. I do wanna read the last page on the bio and I'll add a little something again, because we should get in the habit of, of understanding how these convey our community. Uh, Matthew Stavada's poems have appeared in High Noon, Kijibi, and Windward, uh, Windward Review. He's the translator of Wendy Barker's chapbook, Those Roads, These Moons, from Alabrava Press, which is founded by Octavio uh, Quintinia. He teaches high school in English in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas, which is right here. Also, um, he is finishing his Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. And if I understand correctly, your MFA thesis is due like tonight at midnight. Oh my God. <laughs> no pressure. 
<laughs> and uh, he does also a lot of work with uh, the Frontera. And there's a Houston connection to his book as well, which I love because it is published by a uh, defunct press publishing, which is based in Houston. And I love that we crossed that border as well. I can't wait till we celebrate the launch of the book that comes from your thesis as well. Please welcome Matthew. Good evening, everybody. Um, I want to start real quick and just um, kind of, I heard what Inanna said about uh, when Tony was complaining about Poetry Month. Uh, <laughs> uh, Inanna said that we get Poetry Month because fiction writers get paid. Uh, and, and I agree. Um, so before I read, I just want to give some context. Uh, like Tony said, well, first, sorry. Thank you to the Guadalupe and thank you to Tony Diaz. Uh, what, this, what this center does for our community is, um, is, 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 is crucial. Um, and that's just what I wanted, to, and that's how this book came about uh, through community. As you guys know, I'm the co-director of Verso Frontera, uh, which is a literature and arts festival founded by Octavio Quintanilla. Uh, and I actually met Miranda Ramirez, who is the founder and publisher of Defunct at Verso Frontera. She, uh, we met at, we met in uh, last year, and she invited me to Houston to read. And I just went up there with a bunch of poems and read and, Literally, as I'm walking back from finishing my reading, she asked me if I had some poems to give her for a chat book. And four months later, here we are. Um, so thank you to Miranda. Um, yeah, it's very much a, I don't like saying the story because a lot of people, because it's very much like not a normal uh, process of like submission, failure, submission, failure, or sorry, it's not failure, but sin submission, rejection, submission, rejection. Uh, I was very fortunate. Um, this book comes from my thesis, um, but it stands on its own. Uh, it's a book of it's a book about relationships, uh, familial, uh, parental, uh, romantic, the loss of and the gain of what we what we sacrifice at the altar of these relationships and what we gain from them, and what we lose, and how that changes us. Um, yeah, and I'm not very good at giving context. If you were at my thesis defense, you know that. Uh, I'm, not very, I'm, not, I'm not very good at giving context, but I'll get into the poems. The first section of the book is centered around the romantic, and then the second section of the book is centered around the parental and the familial. And then I actually end with a new poem that's not in here, so that's cool. Um, so the first book is, or the first poem in the collection is called Soliloquy. I have two of these poems called Soliloquy. And if you look at the, I'm not gonna hold it up because no one's gonna be able, you guys are all just gonna go like that. Um, if the physical appearance of it, I really wanted to get the sound down of what a soliloquy sounds like, you know, from a theater perspective. Uh, and both of the, the Soliloquy one poem prefaces the first section and then the second one, uh, the second Soliloquy poem prefaces the second section. So this is the first poem, Soliloquy one. Trembling stars glazed in blood, shards not yet broken. Was it now we decided to leave, abandon, surrender this hallucin bliss? How could we know more than what the light gives just as the brightest stars die so soon? There is always more to say. Uh, no, I mean, you can, you can. I, that's, this is a big thing that I, this is a big argument. It's huge in the, in the, in the, in the, in the poetry scene. I'm glad this is being recorded um, <laughs> because I'm a big proponent of poetry as a sonic space. And I think from my perspective, I hope I don't offend anybody, but from my perspective, poetry is better digested in silence. So after I, after I finished reading the poem, that moment of silence right after the poem is the, is the time where you take to really sit with it. And I think it's a disservice, like I said, I'm probably offending people, but I think it's a disservice to, to the poem itself and to your experience of it to you know, clap. So feel free to clap, I'm not against it, but this like, me and, me and, my, 
me and my friends in the me and my friends in the the poetry community this is an ongoing argument that i'm just all by myself on everybody there's a poet in or there's a poet in houston his name is uh, glenn shaheen and he says that we are in the era of applauding after poems and i just wholeheartedly disagree but like i said we have free will um the next poem is called birds in the light of morning Out on the porch this morning, a flock of birds ask me where I've been. I don't know how to tell them, for what do birds know of loss? But if I could tell them how I followed you as you leapt into the air, as dust does when the door opens, to where would I say you've gone? And they see through me. One claims they saw you on the street, entangled in someone else, a vulture picking clean a deer's corpse. And I point them to the sun now rising, and they vault into the sky as you did, headed towards an undefined horizon, firmament found only in the eyes of someone else. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's the best reaction. Thank you for that. Um, straight up. The next poem is uh, called A Lover's Camping Trip. And if you know Octavio Quintanilla, he's my thesis advisor. We battled, uh, I think we're still battling about this poem, uh, even though the thesis is due tonight. Um, <laughs> so let's see what y'all think. Uh, it's called A Lover's Camping Trip. Their skin wet with dew and yearning, pulled as if by string towards the moon. I have seen this before, another life. I imagine the language of trees filling their mouths and moss weaving into their hair and owls crooning in their retinas, all proof that true desire knows its source. Though I wish I could tell them the blanket they brought will not keep them warm, that the food they didn't finish will attract bears or that they may never leave the memories of this place behind, no matter what rituals they employ. But they wouldn't listen, and why would they? With the night sky charged and smoldering as his hand falls down her stomach and her teeth clench across his chest, who would deny themselves any of this? I love the mmms, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's the good stuff. That's all right, that, that's permitted. Um, the next poem's called A New Day. A new day arrived on the shadow of the one that came before, and we marked each night's passing by the slow chorus of grackles chirping in the oaks outside our window. With no names for the mornings that came and went, we stumbled into our waking slumber. I want to pry open those moments, pull them apart and extract any proof, any sign that you were real. But instead, I have taken these memories and placed them in the mouths of other women, the way a librarian places worn down books on the bottom shelves. And still I see you in the wrinkles of blankets and bed sheets. And still the winter rain finds its way under the front door. Uh, and the last poem in the, the lovey-dovey uh, heartache section is called After. After. In the black morning, the convenience store sign burns white neon and is a moon whose light I trace along the ripples of the lake where I first placed my trembling hand between your legs, the autumn wind in my face and your hair. Nothing was uncertain. We discovered more about flesh that could fill the pages of a book written on the waves of an ocean, and now there are days where church bells are the only way I can remember my name. And what if there was no lake, no moon, no morning, no light, no sign, and my hands were as steady as orchids in snow? What if it was just you and all my shadows? How would I even breathe? Uh, so the second section, like I said, it deals with uh, parental relationships, familiar relationships. Um, 
Yeah, I don't like giving context. Let's get into it. Um, so like I said, the first poem in this section is called uh, Soliloquy 2. You quietly play hide and seek with your father's corpse and he never finds you. You who hides behind plastic trees. You who collapses like paper under winter's melted snow. You who is me writing this poem while your father's corpse says, come out, I give up. Thank you, Guadalupe. Um, next poem is called Prayer to the Unseen. Bewitch me, hold my eager mouth to your nipple, tie the river twice around my wrist, move through me as fire moves through trees, create from these wounds spectacular scars. Neglect me, forsake me, my skin weaved into yours. Teach me to draw the shadows of smoke. Poem is called List. This morning I forgot the date on which I found your body. Foam running down your chin as if trying to return to an ocean. And I sat in my car outside of the job I swore to never get, eyes closed and furious for all that time has stolen from me. Trying to remember all that appeared was a series of lists, bills, to do, Grocery. If only I had made a list of that day, perhaps I could remember it now. The dogs barking at the closed door, the smell of rotten cabbage on my tongue, your eyes deep like the lake we'd swim in, your face the color of my mother's couch. For a moment, the air in my car felt divided, as if we were sharing it again. This next poem is about fathers. Uh, it's called Requiem, Requiem for Future Suffering. It took 65 years for my father to realize he would die alone. He confessed this to me after forgetting who I was. He began to tell me about a dream in which he was watching himself sleep in the middle of a field of tall grass and how the echoes of wind filling the spaces between blades caused the view of himself to gradually fade until there was nothing but the imprint of his body outlined in, outlined in grass on the hard earth. He awoke from the dream covered in piss as I began to tell him how dogs, as they begin to die, will isolate themselves from their owners and begin to sleep more in places they never did. In the negative space of our conversation, he falls asleep on the couch in his one bedroom apartment. There is no stranger feeling than watching your father sleep inoculated against the misconception that we could ever be alone. Mouth agape in wonder. I got two more here and then one from the phone, which is horrible etiquette, I apologize. Uh, this next poem is called Lorca's Palm Leaves. I traded a handful of weed with a man begging on the street for a palm cross that looked like Lorca. Though a heart, not Jesus, was nailed to the cross and a rose, not blood, centered the symbol of surrender. And yet still I thought of Jesus as he walked into Jerusalem, the palm leaves under his feet. And yet still I thought of Lorca crucified on a hillside, his heart made of leaves tossed into the wind. And now, this man finding shade under a tree weaves my sins in exchange for something that will only amplify the hunger. Uh, this is the last poem in the collection. It's also the titular poem, which is a word I always take advantage of saying. Um, Uh, this poem is called In Search of the Nusian Oceans. This, com this poem, I'll give you context on this one, because everybody, I love, um, I think for the rest of my life, I'm gonna write books that have one word in it that just are so that everybody stumbles over and doesn't know how to pronounce, because it's happened everywhere. Um, I was reading, I like to read science uh, articles, because there's a lot of poetic material in science. Um, 
And I was reading this one article in Cosmos, and it, it was talking about like uh, the planet Venus, uh, how people once thought, or scientists once thought, once thought that oceans just covered it. It was just a planet of oceans that's since been, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not true apparently, but I really like that idea, and I really like that image, and this is where this pump comes from. In search of the Nusian oceans. It takes thousands of years of rainfall to produce an ocean, which makes me think of all the lifetimes found in a wave, which makes me closer to my own reckoning. I imagine the places my consciousness could end up, a grove of orange trees, a stone beneath a waterfall, but how often do we end where we began? There was once a time when we believed oceans adorned the planet Venus, but science, as with all our greatest stories, has corrupted this too. How I could reawaken there surrounded by ancient rains. How I could walk head down against the waves in one direction and always end up somewhere else. Thank you. Oh, I have one more poem. Hold on, because I'm going to read from the phone, which I, I'm sorry. But like Tony said, I'm a high school teacher and I'm exhausted. Um, this poem, uh, I, so, the poet Kaveh Akbar says that there's two types of poets. There's a cat poet and an ox poet. The ox poet wakes up every day, uh, sure of him, himself, themselves, uh, working no matter what, working every day. And then there's a the cat poet who lays around for the majority of the day. And if a streak of light comes through the window, they spark on it, or they find different, or they find inspiration and hop, and hop on it. Uh, I would like to classify myself as a recovering cat poet uh, that has hopes to become an ox poet. I just don't see that happening anytime soon. So this poem is the, was the first poem that I had written in, I wanna say three or four months. And I don't know where it came from. Uh, all the writers in the room know that feeling. Um, but I was supposed to be proctoring, this is recorded. I was supposed to be proctoring an exam and I just got this one line in my head, and I, you know, it was, it was still proctoring, but I, I started writing it down, and it, it, uh, how it came out is what you're gonna hear. There was no revision yet, uh, as much as Octavio wants me to. Um, so this poem is called Origin Story. The first time you got high, your sister watched from the opposite couch in your grandparents' house while your uncle encouraged deeper breaths. In between hits, he'd explain how this shit won't show up on piss test, and you pretend to understand what this means, feign awe. He starts preaching about your theos and theas and how quickly they left the south side, how once they got money or married it, they forgot where they came from. He says, it ain't ever gonna be me. He says, I bleed for this shit and shows you a t-shirt he pulls out of his closet hung up like a piece of sports memorabilia. And you question whether you will ever know if the story he told about the shirt was true, that a guy from another street came round running his mouth and my uncle and his homie stomped him out, or if it was the crack, or if it was the demon that has followed every man in your family since your mother's grandfather ate a shotgun shell for dinner one night behind the tool shed. Years later, after your grandparents died and your uncle sold everything in their house, after he blamed the family for your cousin's suicide, after he himself died in a motel convulsing and alone, your mother tells you that the blood on the shirt was the same blood that fell across the open field decades ago, the same blood the demon craves, the same blood that moves in you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we do have time for three questions before we get to the main point of tonight, which is for you to purchase some books to start or build or edify your family library. Also, you'll get to meet some of the folks that help run the behind the scenes. It's a lot of work to run a bookstore. Um, you know, this is wonderful right now, but I want to thank our bookstore manager, Alma. And right now you're going to meet... Uh, Zenadia, as you buy the book out there. Um, and then it's really taking home the story. 
You're going to get it signed, a picture with them, and that's fantastic. And um, don't forget the first two folks, the next two folks that, that purchased Guadalupe's book will also get the ARC. And I'm going to, again, abuse my... And I'm going to repeat it for the for the live stream. If you, if you can come up here kindly and, and answer that. The question is that uh, Guadalupe talks a lot about, as you said, how much she loves writing, but the components of it and the parts of it. So you wanted her to, to, to even bring out more joy about that. I think that, and I tell my, I used to tell my students this all the time, writing is something that is so important to me. It's like, breathing. If I can't write, then something inside me dies. And so I find moments at every time I can, I can steal a moment from somewhere to just sit down and do it. So I tell my students, if there's a passion you have, may it, maybe it's not writing, maybe it's drawing, maybe it's, you know, community work. But if there's a passion you have, and that you feel like it's such an ingrained part of you that your spirit moves you in that direction, then you make the time. You make the moments every day. I used to sit in, the, in, my, in my car while there was practice, soccer practice, and just watch the soccer practice from my car while I was riding, because that was my little stolen moments when I had three little boys and I was a, a full-time teacher. Yay for the teachers in the room. But <laughs> uh, sometimes you have to steal those moments, but, but it is something you need to feed. If you don't feed your spirit, if you only feed your body, you will not be happy. And life is too short not to feed your spirit. Thank you. That's beautiful. And actually, it reminds me when, when uh, I had the chance to interview you, you talked a lot about the joy of writing as well. So I could totally see why you tapped into that. And that, what a wonderful message for folks watching. If you watch one clip, if you post one thing, share that. And I think that's the great message. Last question. This is for extra credit. If you quest, oh, you won't have to take the final exam. Excellent. Yes. I love it. I'm going to repeat it for the live stream. Uh, you will be getting college credit for this because that was a great question. There are common themes in both of their works, not just about topics, but also about uh, life and even actually in some, some of the prose and for the word language too as well. I mean, now that you mentioned that. So uh, you wanted them to comment upon some of what they saw overlapping as well. And if you could come up to the mic and share that. When I got the flyer from Tony, um, 
that uh and i saw that i would be sharing space with guadalupe and i did research on her new project i was for lack of a better word stoked to have this reading because the the juxtaposition of my themes and what i presumed were hers uh i was is very exciting i've never been in a reading like that where i had so, someone whose work was so different uh than mine on the surface but then whenever she read you see you see those parallels like like, like natalia said um, as far as um, family, uh, what role that plays? I mean, the only the only person I care to impress at all in my life is right over there, and it's um, it's my daughter Valentina. Um, that's <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's uh, in 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 regards to that, it's an engine. Uh, you, I mean. I don't know. I want her. I, I just wanted her to be proud of me, and that's it. Um, so that's th that's where I come from, from uh, for that question. Thank you, Natalia. Well, after hearing you read, I was just blown away too. I just every time a new poem would come up, I kept thinking, "That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about love. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about fathers, right? I am talking about uh, our." our need to find our stars, to follow our stars, to find our own way in the world. And I think that's really important for us as Mexicanos to bring these themes to light because we are not just writing for ourselves, we're writing for our community. We're not writing for New York or for publication or for reviewers. We're writing for you. We're writing for our gente. And so I think that's why those themes were so the, so interlaced today because we we have the same heart we all, as uh, writers we have that heart that need to to share love with our community thank you that's fantastic i hope you enjoyed tonight as much as i did i really feel uh full of joy and ecstatic let's continue that uh this is your chance now to get uh your books from the counter and then get them signed, and I will model that by getting mine signed first. Thank you all so much for coming. We'll see you next uh, next May. Gracias.